Thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm Douglas. So I work just down south of Edinburgh in King's Building, so this is a brilliant opportunity for me to come and talk, so thanks for sticking around on a sunny Friday afternoon. Um, so this talk, basically I'll introduce myself, um, say what I'm doing here basically, and then I'm going to talk through a case study virtually of how I've been using Python in my work to uh, mix science, data analysis and web development, try and create some online tools for people to access um, analysis about air quality. You make it easy and quick for people. And I'll finish with a few lessons I've learned during this uh, process and uh, where I hope this project's going to go in the future. So I, my official title is a postdoctoral researcher at the university, but I don't actually do that much research anymore. Um, I have a background in atmospheric chemistry, and everything I've learned coding-wise has been self-taught because I needed it. And I started off in Fortran doing atmospheric models and uh, sort of developing in them and working them there. Basically, weather forecasting models like you'd get off a Met Office or anything, but you stick some atmospheric chemistry in and you get a pollution forecast. Um, and Fortran's great for that, but Fortran isn't great for data analysis, so I needed something nice to process the output from it. Um, and that's where Python came in. I did use IDL for a while, and then I ran away from it like wildfire. Um, Python's been much nicer to me. So now my work is mainly working in my research group as the group coder or data wrangler person. I've heard of the term the other day, research data engineer, and maybe I fall into that category, but I don't know. It's just a title, isn't it? So I'm somewhere in the middle of all these things. Uh, hopefully not jack of all trade, master of none, but could argue that. Um, right, so a brief introduction about air quality. Now, if you saw the keynote this morning, this was touched on, basically. All it is is a measure of how polluted the air we breathe is. So air quality and air pollution are used synonymously and interchangeably between people. And in this case, I'm specifically talking about pollution with direct health effects. Uh, so nitrogen dioxide, ozone, particulate matter, which is basically just soot. And this is not, in this case, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane, because these affect climate and not health directly. And all these are generally emitted from traffic. We also get natural sources, such as fires. And interestingly, there was actually a fire on Blackford Hill, which is just uh, near the observatory in Edinburgh yesterday, luckily put out by the fire brigade before it got too far. Maybe it was a stray cigarette or something. But you could smell that smoke in central Edinburgh. Um, so that was having an impact on the air quality. Um, just to bring the tone down a bit, there's been in the news an awful lot recently. A quick Google it brings up lots of stories about how it affects your health and impacts it's having, and it's pretty horrible. Um, and it's becoming more and more in people's forefront of their mind, which is a good thing, generally. However, we need to monitor this, because just saying it's there or smelling it, I mean, it doesn't give us much information. So what we need is some way to get this monitored air pollution into an accessible form, which is where Python comes in. And this is a little quote up in the top corner that I heard a talk yesterday by someone called Alex Jacob. Jacob, I'm not sure. But I thought it was perfect. Data only has value when it's relevant. And that's so true. Because you get a number from a monitoring station, and it is meaningless to most people. Who cares if ozone down the road is 300? Like, what does that mean? But to make that measurement into something useful, you need to spend time and energy gathering the data, knowing where it is, processing it, and putting it in a form you know. And to most people, this is daunting, because they don't have the right skill set. They don't know where to look. Even people with the skill set, it's time wasting. So the reason I kind of started this job is because my boss wanted to free up some of his time when he's writing grants. He doesn't want to spend a day trying to plot this uh, air quality somewhere. He wants a quick, easy thing so he can do it in half a minute and get on with the rest of his day, basically. And the thing with these, this hurdle in the way is, for most people, it's too much. It's, you know, if it's out of sight, out of mind, I don't want to bother with that. So. What we need is something to combine this data collection, the gathering of it, the analysis, and then visualize it in a way people can understand. So ideally, a set of tools that anybody can use and uh, that are accessible and understandable by anybody. And the idea of, ideally, you want a tool that can be used from anyone, anyone school children to academics. That is a broad range of uh, people, but you know, it's an ambition. Um, so the solution is why we're all here. Python, and finally get onto Python, since we're yeah. um, So first steps first, 
is getting the data. Now, this has been uh, not too bad for this. So I'm getting, for this case study, I'm using uh, air quality data from DEFRA, which are a UK department, uh, government department, currently owned by Michael Gove. I don't know what that's good or bad. But. And there are over 150 of these sites currently working in the UK. There's maybe another 200 that have been previously working have been shut down for various reasons. And these each take hourly measurements of all sorts of various pollutants. So there's an awful lot to deal with, especially since some have been going back uh, since 1975. So there's a lot of measurements, but on the grand scheme of things, actually all the measurements have ever taken only adds up to a few gigabytes. So it's not big data, but it's messy and annoying and hidden away and um, is there, but yeah, not many people use it. So these is a little plot of where all the stations are spread across the UK. The nearest one to us here is just by Arthur's seat. So this is a picture of the one in Edinburgh. It's a green box there. Um, and you'd be glad to know that Edinburgh is generally pretty good, according to this, for air pollution. However, you've got to consider things that was alluded to in the keynote this morning, that this air quality station is right next to a park. It's set away from the road and is yeah, not a busy area at all. You start putting one of these outside the road outside and you're getting a completely different picture. So there are all these stations scattered around the UK and annoyingly, DEFRA doesn't have a nice, neat spreadsheet where they all are, like a list CSV file, longitude. So I need to find every bit of information about these sites so I can start using them properly and usefully. Um, so talking about coordinates, how long they've been going for, what pollutants they measure, um, codes, you know, like the European site codes they have, all these sort of thing. Um, and this is where Python finally comes in, is data scraping, which has been an incredibly useful tool. And I've been using Beautiful Soup, which is a great module for passing out HTML code. So it's basically putting your request there, a web page from, H, from using Python request, um, put it into Beautiful Soup, and it passes it all out for you. And you can search for bits you want. So you say, all right, for this site, Aberdeen Prince in there, give me all the bits of information you've got about it. And you get a nice table out. And although DEFRA have been great, and you could email them and ask for this sort of information, this is a very quick method of getting a lot of information you need. And although on the website, each one of these sites has its own web page. So you have to go on, look, go on, look. You can do that in a loop, no problem. Like just click through them all. So now I've got all these sites. I need to get the pollution data from them. And again, this is another thing that is not made easy by the government, but every site has its data available in a CV that you can just, CSV, sorry, you can just go to a particular URL and it's there. However, you need to know that URL and that's not available. I managed to get that by finding someone else's code who did some work with them a couple of years ago, going through that R code, finding the URL that they used. And so it's a simple task if you know the URL. The problem is uh, you need to know the site code and the year. So each web page, so for instance, Edinburgh, the site code's ED3. If you want 2018, you'd have to use those. This data is not any useful structure. You want data from 2018 in Edinburgh, great, it's all there. You want specifically carbon monoxide from the past five years from Edinburgh, Aberdeen, and Glasgow, say. So you're talking about 15 web pages there, which with their own information in, a lot of which is useless to you, because you're only after carbon monoxide, say, not nitrogen, or whatever. But it's there, and it's available, um, and that's good. We have some data to play with. So the next step, is analysis, um, which is the fun bit that I enjoy. And of course, I use pandas. However, I am ashamed to say I came to pandas quite late in the game. I was quite stubborn in the terms of everything I'd used, just use NumPy and that worked, so why bother changing anything else? However, just a quick Google of, oh, I want to read this CSV off a web page. What's a quick way of doing that? Pandas is easy. And like, oh, I'll try that one line. Oh, that was easy. Oh, that's a nice data frame in a time series, oh, this is really nice. And I wish I'd spent a couple of hours, maybe, a couple of years ago, spending myself how to learn, uh, teach myself pandas. And I would say to myself, I don't even want to think about how much time, but it's uh, a bit of a lesson in don't be so stubborn in your code you use. Things like filtering or resampling are such powerful tools in pandas. It makes things so quick. It is fantastic. And there are also great tutorials and documentation out there. You know, any, and I'd say Stack Overflow, which I basically owe my PhD to, is uh, full of pandas. That is just, you know, want to do anything? Pandas, pandas, pandas. But. 
So we've got this data in pandas. We can do all sorts to it. I guess the next step is we want to visualize it. And I use Plotly. Now, for a long time, I used MATLAB, um, which has been great. But then I discovered Plotly. And this provides a very simple way. So this is a very small snippet of code that will make that graph on the side. That's all you need. And it will make you an interactive plot that you, has uh, features like hover and zoom. And you can change colors really easily. And if you're thinking about interacting with people, having something that they can change, they can manipulate, or not manipulate the data, but you know, make how they want to see it, it becomes a lot more interactive and a lot more personal, instead of just having a static graph there that's showing you whatever you want to show. And it's great because it makes things incredibly simple. Now, these are three, three I mean, the, what they are isn't important, but you can make very simple plots. So you subplots things, any bar plots, wind roses. So that's more to do a wind rose. There are a few um, modules out there now that do it, but totally just seems miles above the rest. So, so far, I'm in comfortable territory for me. This is what I've done for the best part of six years, I'd say. Um, it's some sort of data analysis or something. However, the next step for me is putting it online. This is going very much into the unknown. And doing something like this really highlights how you can think you know about Python. And then you really don't. Um, <laughs> but after a little Google and search around, I went with Django. It seemed like a good framework. It's a huge framework. It has lots of documentations and lots of tutorials, which is great, but also a little daunting. Someone who's never used this before, it's like, oh, God. But I'd say there's lots of tutorials. And I know it's not aimed at me, but I'd find the Django's Girls tutorials on how to set up a website using Django is great for anybody starting off with this. I know there are other frameworks out there. Um, and a lot of this is very much of an uncertain light. Like, I'll try it. I'll see. I don't know if this is the right thing for me, but I'm going to go with it and see how far it goes. And especially with Django, it seemed it's very popular. It's, yeah, let's say lots of documentation and tutorials, but it's not really designed, as far as I could tell, for the sort of websites I want to make. Um, it's mainly focused on blogs and that sort of thing, but give it a go. Um, and I might be preaching to the choir here, but basically Django View will easily create a lot of files for you in a template. Um, and these files include things like urls.py, uh, which is a list of the website URLs you want to be called. So your actual website name goes in there, and then it calls this views.py, um, which processes things and renders web pages. And then model and it just sets out this thing for you, which, as a beginner, in uh, website, uh, but yeah, Pythonic websites, it's, it's ideal. You know, it, it click and play, basically. And then you can start spending the next couple of weeks breaking it day after day. Um, so again, yeah, you can type in your website. And by the way, this is the name of the website. But it heads to urls.py, which then says to views.py, hey, this person wants to visit this website, do something. Which then says to this other module, models.py, well, they want something from this website process some data, get something from a database, do something, and then it'll find, here you go. It's back to views.py. And then that mixes that, it renders it with some HTML and CSS, and it makes yourself a pretty website. And hey, presto, the website is born. Now, this is a very simple, static website at the moment with some buttons on you can click. But um, it was fairly simple to do that. And Python, you know, the amount of tutorials out there, Python really helps that. But as I say, Django is a great framework. But for what I wanted to do, which was lots of people interact with this website, change graphs, play with them, it's not, I found, the easiest thing to do to create multiple instances or interactive pages, especially without reading scary words like JavaScript. Um, so I discovered, along with Plotly, who do nice graphs, they do something called Dash, which is another framework. And this is taken straight from their website. It says they build analytical web applications with no JavaScript required. So that's two thumbs up from me. and then. This is built on uh, their JavaScript to so React, Flask, and it ties it in. So you can have interactive things like drop down sliders, graphs, whack that with your analytical code, and you can make something that looks good pretty easily. And I thought, this is ideal. So Dash creates these apps, which could be standalone websites by themselves. In my case, it's not. Uh, I'll explain a little bit later. Um, every time a website's loaded, a new app instance created. So you get one per user. They do what they want. It doesn't affect anybody else. Um, each app layout 
Oh, sorry, each app has like a layout of this. Basically, in Python, you say, I want this, then this, I want a drop down menu, then I want some descriptive statistics, I want a plot, I want a selection menu. You can click all that. And then you click them, and it calls these callbacks, which are Python decorators for functions. So it clicks this, and this decorator goes, oh, someone's said they wanted uh, this color bar to be yellow, change this, and it sends it back and updates the page, and it's brilliant. So with a bit of wrangling, I managed to put my Dash app in my original Django framework with a lot of help of people in forums. Um, so Django framework sort of holds everything together, and Dash app is within inside that, and that does all the hard work, basically. They gets the data processing it, displaying uh, quickly on the website, except hold on. I don't know if it wants to. Yeah, great. Hold on, I'll just type it in, might be easier. So you end up with something that's not showing on this screen. That's great. <laughs> So this is a simple website. It's not that pretty to look at. It's a work in progress. But Dash provides things. So this is a selection tool to get some data you might want. So we can go so define it by region, let's say central Scotland, since we're here. And I want all urban sites. Just get rid of the all. It's thinking it's, this is using a quite a cheap server at the moment. So you have to, and eventually, when that's finished spinning around, Okay. It selects all the sites that are in central Scotland that are counted as urban. So we can click Edinburgh St. Leonard's, which is the nearest one. We'll stick with the, uh, with the time series, select any variables they use. Let's look at nitrogen dioxide, click Submit. Now this is calling the data and plotting it up. And this is all there. And so this is what's good about Dash is you can hover, hover data, get different points. You can zoom in to look at more points. Um, you can download it if you want. Let's reset the axis. And with Dash as well, so you can make these interactive things. You click weekly, and this is saying, all right, someone wants to resample this data every week. And it goes there, and it says there's a pandas module that easily does that, just resample week. Um, or you want to stick it in a line graph instead. Um, and you can just add more plots onto these. So we have, say, a histogram, which you can... Uh, Change the number of bins to I don't know, 50 if you like. Um, this is an example of the average concentration over one day. So it's taking all the time series and saying, well, look, there's a whole day there, basically. We can split that into weekdays, so Monday, Tuesday, et cetera. And you can see peaks at rush hour. Um, so it has all these really useful tools. Uh, oh, go back to. and makes a nice play website. Or website you can play with, sorry. Problem is, there's too much data, really. Um, it's time to use the database. Previously, that, that website was calling the DEFRA website. Every time someone put in a request, I want this much, and it's going off. But as I said before, with the way they've structured their data, this is just not feasible. Um, it's calling it every time. It's fine for a small amount of data. It won't really take more than a second, maybe. But as soon as you start getting decent amounts, it's taking a very long time, and eventually, it's going to crash. So better data management is needed, and that's where Django comes back into its own again. So using Django, it's really simple to integrate a SQL database into it, and I basically just copied all the data that DEFRA had and whacked it on this database, which now Django calls. It leaves DEFRA alone, sort of, because it needs constant updates. DEFRA updates every day. I just have a worker process in the background saying, oh, it's morning, go collect some new data, write that down. and now. Any combination of millions of data points is available. You want every uh, 3 o'clock on a Wednesday outside Aberdeen, brilliant. It'll do it for you, no problem. So that's where it's at at the moment, and it is still early days, but it's been a good learning curve. And there are developments that like to do this. There are many, many bug fixes that need to be done. It's quite easy to go on that web page and break it. It doesn't work on a mobile, for instance. It doesn't really work on Internet Explorer. Um, but, you know, it's a work in progress. I'd like to integrate more data with it, so more stations. Uh, a lot of European stations and a lot of council stations. This picture here is 
a new sensor for CO2, even though I said I wasn't talking about it, but we could include it, um, on top of Blackford Hill, the observatory there. We, so that data could be available soon. Um, talking about satellite data and models, although then you're going from uh, gigabytes for entire decades to terabytes per day, so your data management starts getting a lot more uh, intricate, I suppose. And also to get more feedback from any users. You know, the people who are using this is actually useful. I've made some plots, but what, you know, I've showed you simple ones. What would be really useful? You know, comparisons against different things. So that's where we're at at the moment. And I start to finish with lessons I've learned from doing this um, and sort of going into the unknown. The first one is just jump in. I spent a long time being like, oh, that doesn't quite fit what I'm doing. And that's, but you'll never find the perfect tutorial. And it's best to start with something that's very imperfect and build it up than trying to find. You know, wasting your time trying to find something that's better. And in that sense, be adaptable. I started with Django. It didn't quite work for what I wanted. I went with Dash. I looked at some other things. I went back to Django. You know, there's no point belligerently sticking with things. And so don't be scared to make the wrong choices. I started a lot of websites where this is just not right. So it's not what I wanted. But I'm very prone to just sitting there twiddling my thumbs and thinking, oh, what am I going to do? But take your time to learn new things. In my case, Pandas is... Uh, what I would have learned, but you know, I suppose that's the case in any walk of life, not just Python. Don't get bogged down by the little things. I found with writing this website that I found it a lot better to quickly do something that makes you feel like you've achieved a lot, and then you can be like, all right, I'll play with the colors of the uh, bar plot later or the spacing. That doesn't really matter right now. What I want is to get something going and get excited about it. But in that mind, keep an eye on what you're trying to do, because um, you end up sort of getting, again, looking at these small things and be like, well, what is it I'm trying to do here? Is this, is spending a week going over this, this bit of code that's going to resample actually useful for anyone, or is it just something I want to do? Also, don't reinvent the wheel, and this might be a case for academics especially, because I know people, myself included, are always hesitant to use other people's code because it's always a bit scary putting your faith in results that is a, almost a black box. You'd be like, here's put this data into a Python module or a website and it comes out the other side. What's it going to show? If you know what it does step by step, that's good, but you're going to waste a lot of time doing that. And at some point, you've got to trust people. You can't redo everything. And lastly, go for a walk. <laughs> Take time out of your day. <laughs> I found if I get stuck, that's the best way to do it, really. Just go out, and especially with air quality. If I go outside and it smells, I'm, <laughs> better do something about it. So that's me. Thanks for listening. And... More tech problems, isn't it? Yeah. No. Will you be at the sprints? Uh, I've not planned on being, but I live in Edinburgh, so no. <laughs> I could be. <laughs> I don't know what. I've not looked at what sprints are. <laughs> I could just repeat the question back. If, yeah, so he asked if I was at the at the sprints. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that question, if you didn't hear, it was about using data from uh, the Scottish government in, in Edinburgh and Friends of the Earth have lots. And yeah, so there's so much data to be used out there. DEFRA is just a starting block. But I have uh, a few friends who work at the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, specifically looking at air quality, and they have a lot more stations available. And stuff, but I would love to use it, yeah. And more the better in terms of educating. As in, say, say with Edinburgh. You go on the DEFRA website and look. That's going to show you it's fine, but sometimes it's not. You know? Sorry, Dan. The, the stations that Scotland has are um, it's like a lot of roads. So yeah. they've been breaking new limits, European new limits now for uh, the past, past few years.
sorry, the, um, the local monitoring stations in Scotland, are, lots of them are placed along roads, and um, uh, Scotland's been breaking legal limits um, along these, and so that, this is the motivation behind trying to better monitor, better check these results and visualize them. So um, I'll, I'll speak to you later, but... Um, it'd be, but yeah, I mean, the yeah. more data, the better, basically. Yeah, I'll put you in touch. Thanks. Any other question? Do you have... Ah, uh, the start here in the back. Be quick. Thanks. Thanks for a great talk. Um, are they, do you know if, like, so if you're using data from various different sources, um, like you were just saying, um, do you think that the what you collect from different types of stations will be comparable with each other? Will there be sort of like technical variations in those? Do you think? There is a problem with that. So things to be directly comparable. People argue so different types of instruments might have different calibration things, and you saw in the example uh, went on the website briefly. You can select it by different environments. So Edinburgh is considered urban background, but you might get urban um, traffic, which is on a road, or and these things. I mean, you can say one's more so than the other. They're not as that directly comparable. Um, you can't do it easily, but it's doable. There are ways around it, but yeah, it's not just this number versus this number, basically. There was another? Yeah. This is the last question. Yeah, sure, if you want. Uh, it's just a super quick question. Uh, is your system open source? Do you accept pull requests? Uh, it is open source, <laughs> and yes, I would accept pull requests. It is a mess right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll la last quick question. And this is um, a question from uh, friends of friends. So this is a real case that the parents of the primary school, they, they are convinced that the, the air around the primary school and the air quality is bad for the children. But then, however, they don't have a way of convincing that the local, authority, local council to say the, the air quality there is really bad for that. So do you have any suggestions or any toolkit that for, as a citizen of the, or the parents of the school can use it and to collect it and then convince the authorities to say, this is a problem? Um, it's difficult because there are a lot of people who think that, and I would argue rightly so. There are lots of groups uh, I know from university side, and I imagine there are from commercial sides as well, that are actually looking for uh, ways to test their instruments and gather data. So there's one recently um, from the University of Birmingham here that they did a study around schools in, uh, within Birmingham. So they uh, brought some monitoring stations, and it wasn't, didn't cost the school anything, didn't cost parents anything. It was, it was a research project done by Birmingham, but then they fed it into the community and got the community involved in showing and their results actually put a no traffic zone around their local school. Um, so there are, there are out, they are out there. Unfortunately, I don't do anything directly measurement wise. Um, I could write down a few places you might be able to look afterwards. Okay, that's uh, all the time we have allotted. So let's thank the speaker. Thank you.